Hello, welcome to Poland. We're here today to have a look at the oldest naval destroyer in the world, the Bliskowitza. This British-designed Polish destroyer was one of two Grom class vessels ordered on the 29th of March 1935. She was commissioned in 1937 and fought alongside the Royal Navy. When launched, she was one of the fastest and most heavily armed ships of her kind. The Grom class destroyers were named after Thunder, Grom and Lightning Bliskowitza, respectively. Although Grom's keel was laid first, Bliskowitza was completed before Grom. In other words, Lightning came before Thunder. She was built between the 1st of October 1935 and the 1st of October 1936 as part of a Polish naval build-up programme that sought to bolster Poland's defences against maritime threats. The Grom-class destroyers were superior to German and Russian destroyers in terms of armament. They were also designed specifically for operations in the Baltic and thus included mine layers. Two more ships were ordered from J. Samuel White, but the ships were never laid down due to the outbreak of World War II. The biggest losses at sea during World War II were by the use of underwater weapons, such as torpedoes. Initially, the ship was fitted with twin triple tube 550mm torpedo launchers. There then followed a series of retrofits and modifications all the way up to 1951, when this Soviet-designed twin triple tube 533.4mm launcher was finally fitted. It was an effective weapon, with 300 kilograms of explosive, a maximum speed of 45 knots, and a maximum range of 13 kilometers. Firing of the torpedo launchers was by the use of compressed gas, and if this failed, there was also a way to fire it using more traditional gunpowder method. To fight submarines, the ship was armed with 20 depth charges. These can be found in 10 various launchers, such as this, around the ship. In 1951, the small calibre guns on board were replaced with these 37mm guns, located on either side of the ship. They had a rate of fire of 180 rounds per minute and a maximum range of 3 kilometres. Now, the reason they were added was simply to unify with the rest of the Polish Navy. The original air defence for the ship included twin 40mm Bofors guns. One of them you can see here at the moment, and the other you can see behind me in front of the main funnel. They were manned by a crew of seven and had a practical range of 4,000 metres and a rate of fire of 120 rounds per minute. During the Second World War, these particular guns were responsible for taking down four German aircraft. Upon commissioning in 1937, the ship was originally armed with seven 120mm guns. In 1941, she was rearmed, this time with four twin quick firing dual purpose guns. Now, these guns had a much improved elevation on the originals of 85 degrees and a range of 16,500 metres. We're now fortunate to have one of the crew members give us more of an insight into the operation of the main guns. Jest to czterocalowa armata morska, która zamontowana była tutaj w 1941 roku. Pierwotnie okręt posiadał artylerię główną kalibru 120 mm. Prezentowana tutaj armata ma kąt podniesienia luf do 85 stopni i z powodzeniem może razić cele powietrzne. Główną przyczyną, dla których zmieniono właśnie te działa, działa 120 nie mogły podnosić luf więcej niż do kąta 35 stopni. W latach 50. została przeprowadzona kolejna modernizacja po powrocie okrętu z Wielkiej Brytanii po zakończeniu II wojny światowej. Wówczas to wymieniono tylko i wyłącznie lufy tych dział na kaliber 100 mm. Skutkowało to dopasowaniem do ówcześnie używanej w Układzie Warszawskiej amunicji 100 mm. W przypadku tego działa wpłynęło to jeszcze na, wpłynęło na plus, ponieważ zwiększył się delikatnie zasięg o niecałe 200 metrów. We're now moving down to the engineering deck, where the chief engineer is going to give us a guided tour through the heart of this massive vessel. 
Aby okręt mógł zostać uruchomiony, potrzebowaliśmy uruchomienia kotłów głównych okrętu. E, opalane było one paliwem o symbolu 12 Był to ciężki olej, popularnie nazywany mazutem. Pompowany był on poprzez system filtrów przez pompy parowe, działające dzięki potrójnej, trzystopniowej turbinie parowej. Tak wyglądała pompa paliwowa. Została ona przez nas rozcięta, aby pokazać jej wnętrze. Tutaj widzimy trzystopniową turbinę, napędzającą turbinę parową, napędzającą całe urządzenie. Praca pompy wyglądała w ten sposób. Znajdujemy się w unikatowym wnętrzu jednego z trzech kotów głównych ORP Błyskawica, kocioł typu, typu Admiralicja z dwoma przegrzewaczami pary, z trzema walczakami. Wewnątrz tego kotła woda kotłowa była zamieniana na parę. Na początku na parę mokrą, natomiast później po przejściu przez przegrzewacze parę na parę suchą o wysokim stopniu przegrzania, 334 stopnie Celsjusza. Ciśnienie pracy kotła to 27,07 kg na cm kwadrat. 836 rzeźb znoszących, 2872 rurki opadające, były to rurki o płomienicy kotła. Wnętrze kotła wyłożone było, było z cegłą szamotową. Na ścianie kotła było 8 palników, za pomocą których dostarczane było i paliwo, i powietrze, i płomień potrzebny do zainicjowania procesu zamiany wody w parę. Temperatura wewnątrz kotła 2000 stopni Celsjusza. Wydajność takiego kotła to 90 ton pary w ciągu godziny. Znajdujemy się w maszynowni numer 1 w sercu okrętu. Tutaj po prawej stronie właściwe serce, a więc turbina parowa o łącznej mocy 27 tysięcy koni mechanicznych. Były dwa turbo zespoły tego typu, więc łączna moc maszyn błyskawicy to 54 tysiące koni mechanicznych. Zespół turbinowy składał się z turbiny wysokoprężnej, turbiny niskoprężnej i turbiny biegów wstecz. Para puszczana była bardzo powoli na turbinę. Turbina musiała zostać rozgrzana i dopiero po uzyskaniu odpowiedniej temperatury i rozciągnięciu się nawet turbiny do 5 cm można było puścić parę pełną mocą na zespół turbinowy, uzyskując odpowiednie prędkości obrotowe, a tym samym pełną jej moc. Para krążyła w obiegu zamkniętym. Po przejściu z turbiny wysokiego stopnia na turbinę niskiego stopnia trafiała na znajdujący się pod turbiną skraplacz. W tym skraplaczu para zamieniana była z powrotem na wodę kotłową i wracała do zbiorników wody kotłowej, aby nie dopuścić do zniszczenia wału, który z tej maszynowni miał długość 38,5 metra z maszynowni numer 2, 28,5 metra. Średnica takiego wału 360 mm. Zastosowano przekładnię redukcyjną. Przekładnia redukcyjna ze zębami skośnymi deszkowymi mogła przenosić dużo większe obciążenia i dzięki zmniejszeniu prędkości obrotowej turbiny na wale mieliśmy już tylko 440 obrotów na minutę, natomiast moc uzyskiwana wówczas była dużo, dużo większa. Na końcu wału znajdowała się jedna ze śrub. Śrub były w sumie dwie. Średnica śruby błyskawicy to prawie 3,5 metra, a waga śruby lewej 6900 kg, prawej 6850 kg. We're here now on the highest part of the ship, the bridge, and what a great vantage point it is. Some of the equipment you can see located around me. Well, just to my left, we've got the original ship's compass, but just in front of that is a much more modern design that was actually manufactured in 1986. We've also got the engine order equipment. Now, interestingly enough, this ship was capable of producing a localized smoke screen. The controls for that are just down here on the right hand side. Directly behind the bridge, we would have found the first navigator. From this great vantage point, he would relay information to his counterpart below us in the navigation room. We're here now in the navigation room. Directly above us is where we would have found the first navigator. You'll notice that there's a bed in this room. The reason being is because somebody had to be on duty here 24 hours a day. Now the second navigator's job was to plan and actually plot the route of the ship, which he'd do so on the mappage in front of him. He also had the ability from this room then to communicate via this system with the wheelhouse. The ship had two wheelhouses. We're now in the larger of the two, which is located right at the back of the ship. It was manned by a crew of three, 
and was used in case the first wheelhouse became inoperable for whatever reason. Here in the comfort of the captain's salon is where he would relax and entertain guests. Dzień dobry, witam w mojej kabinie. Ta kabina jest taką samą kabiną, bardzo podobną do wszystkich kabin okrętowych oficerów. ORP Bliskovica saw combat throughout World War II, although only in exile from her homeland. Realizing that they were at significant numerical disadvantage against the German Navy, the Polish naval staff decided to evacuate her to the United Kingdom. After some modifications to make her more suitable for use in the rougher Atlantic Ocean, she joined the British Navy in combat operations. After the Norwegian campaign of 1940, ORP Bliskovica returned to the United Kingdom, her host nation. It would not be long before she was sorted again. In late May of 1940, the Wehrmacht had broken through the defences of the combined French, Belgium and British forces, isolating the British Expeditionary Force and some French and Belgian forces in Dunkirk, a total of 300,000 men. From then until 1942, she served mainly on convoy and patrol duties in the Atlantic. Sometime in 1942, she was recalled to the town of Cowes, the place where she was built, for an urgent refit. While she was there, the town came under attack from German bombers. During this incident, ORP Bliskovica played a key role in the defence of cows. She and her crew worked tirelessly to provide a blanket of anti-aircraft fire over the town, forcing the German bombers to remain at high altitude. Although the town and shipyard still suffered heavy damage during the air raid, it is possible that if not for ORP Bliskovica, that damage would have been much more extensive. She was later deployed to support Operation Torch, the Allied operation to regain control of North Africa from the Germans. In early 1944, she returned to Britain, Later that year, she supported carrier strikes against German assets located along the Norwegian coast, before being reassigned to the 10th Destroyer Flotilla in support of Operation Overlord, the planned invasion of Normandy. On the 8th of June, two days after the first D-Day landings, she engaged the German Navy destroyers in the Battle of Ushant, during which the Germans lost two destroyers, ZH-1 and Z-32. It was the last major battle that the ship participated in. She continued to patrol the English Channel until the end of hostilities, For a meritorious service, she was awarded the Golden Cross of the Virtuti Militari, one of Poland's highest military awards, equivalent to the Victoria Cross or the Medal of Honor. Today she stands as a museum ship, a reminder of Polish naval heroism during World War II.